All right, good morning out there. We welcome you here. Glad that you are here. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. Happy Father's Day. So glad for all the dads that can join us. Let's pray, and then we'll uh, we'll sing, and we're going to hear a great message. One note, uh, Pastor Glenn is regular sick this morning, so just not feeling well. I say that because in pandemic times, you had to make sure you differentiate regular sick. So uh, we're going to have Pastor Craig as a blessing for us this morning. Uh, But I'm sure that Pastor Glenn will be on the mend and back soon. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for the chance to gather this morning. Thank you, Lord, that the body is here and that we are ready to worship and to give you glory. And so, Father, just to have the Holy Spirit, would he just join among us and be in in our hearts and our minds as we worship, as we listen, and as we pray. And we'll give you the thanks for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, if you'll stand, we're going to sing together. Good morning. Happy Father's Day and welcome to Pulaski Wesleyan Church. If you're watching online, thank you for joining us. We're really glad you have chosen to worship with us this morning. 
There will be a women's fellowship group, group starting at Pam Rice's home on Thursday evening, starting Thursday, June 24th at 6.30. It'll have a short devotional, a sing-along, or a sing-along or two, and share praise and prayer and fellowship. So, if, ladies, if you're interested, please mark the calendar. Next week is Pastor Luke's last Sunday with us. He has accepted a pastoral call in Maine, so he will be on his new, new mission. Uh, we will have cake and coffee for him in between services out in the foyer. There will be a basket for cards. Uh, we'll also be available in the foyer, so please mark that and be sure to, to wish Pastor Luke well in his new endeavor. On July 4th, just a reminder, we will only have one service at 1030. We still will be having Sunday school. And as always, please check your bulletin for important events and other information. And finally, if you would like to partner with us here at the church, if you're online and would like to support our ministries, there are several ways you can do that. If you're here, there is a church in the back of the foyer that you can drop your offering in. If you're watching online, you can, you can mail your check to the church. You can go to PulaskiWesleyan.org backslash give or text give and the dollar amount to 315-277-720. So now as we get ready for our next worship song, please everybody stand up. Smile and wave. Maybe in the not too distant future, handshakes will come back. I'll see the milling around of people saying hello. But we're not quite there yet, but hopefully not too much farther. Let's continue to worship as we sing, uh, You Never Let Go. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. And I
that's so true so true never lets us go as we sing amazing grace this next to him and there's a little chorus in there let me just read proverbs 3 my son do not forget my teaching but keep my commands in your heart for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity that love and faithfulness never leave you bind them around your neck write them on the tablet of your heart then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. As we sing this song, just a quick reminder in this song, I didn't know this, if you knew this, but I was a wretch, and so were you. And through amazing grace, God found us and brought us back to his side. Let's sing and celebrate this together. song it's how deep the father's love for us uh, it's prayer time so i invite you to come to the altar if you if the lord is calling you that direction uh, 
And just as we sing this song, it says his love for us is vast beyond all measure. Just try to think about that. His love for you is vast beyond any measure that we have. don't have an answer, but Lord, I'm so thankful. We're so thankful that we did, that you ransomed us. We were lost, headed out in the wrong direction, and Lord, you came and you found us, and you rescued us, and Lord, we give you thanks. On this day where we can celebrate fathers, Lord, we celebrate you as the great heavenly father, the one who found and brought us home one who offered his only son for us. Lord, we stand in humbleness. We stand amazed and in awe of who you are. We give you the glory and the honor. But Lord, I know there are hurts and there are needs. There's joys, there's victories. Representative among us here, Lord, I just ask, Father, that you would be working in among us, Lord, touching the tender places where people have been hurt, maybe even this week. Lord, that you'd be healing relationships on this Father's Day, maybe between father and son or father and daughter or father and spouse, Lord, all, all things that are fragile, wonderful, but easily broken. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling physically today. 
maybe making it here was a big effort, a big time, and very difficult. Lord, I would just pray a healing touch. And whatever might be ailing, whatever might be hurting, whatever might be debilitating, Lord, I just pray that you, the great physician, would touch that spot. Lord, I pray for fiscal struggles, Lord. I know that there are some who are struggling financially, and I just pray, Lord, that you would be them with them in that struggle, Lord, encouraging and blessing and taking care of, Lord. And for all of these things, Lord, that you would give us the courage and the strength to press on knowing, knowing that you are with us and that with you, with you with us, whom shall we fear? Lord, we do not fear anything, but Lord, it can get a little burdensome sometimes a little anxiety producing sometimes. And Lord, we pray that you would give us courage and strength. I pray for each person here, Lord, whatever is on their heart and their mind, Lord, that you would meet them right at that spot. And Lord, whatever it might be, that you would comfort them or encourage them or strengthen them or give them peace or celebrate with them. Each person, Lord, is dearly loved by you. And I just ask that you'd be with them. I also ask that you'd be with us as a body, that we would accomplish in this town, in this area, in this village, the things that you would have for us to do, Lord, that lives would be changed, souls would be saved, not because of us, but because of you, of us telling the old, old story of what you've done in our life. So, Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this time. Be with Pastor Glenn. Lord, may he feel better, may be on his feet again and feeling up to uh, par and back on the, in the office and all the things I know he desires to do. Be with Pastor Craig. Really excited what you've laid on his heart on such short notice, but I know that you've brought a message. Thank you for him and all the families, Lord, and all the folks. And just ask, Lord, that you would be with us this morning. May you see in us the heart of worship and the heart of love. And we give you thanks for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, grace to you and peace this morning from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, I, uh, a little on the exhausted side, I spent this uh, last couple days with my parents down in, uh, in PA. Uh, Zeke had the day off of school on Friday, so as soon as he got off the bus on Thursday, we, he got off the bus into the van and we took off on a four hour drive down to my parents on a Friday. It was a whirlwind doing all sorts of things and driving all over PA. And then uh, Saturday, we had a nice relaxing morning until I got a text from Pastor Glenn that uh, he was sick, and hey, would you happen to have a Father's Day sermon that you could dust off and give tomorrow? It's like, sure. <laughs> so uh, we uh, left my parents, got back to our house about seven last night, got the kids to bed, and stayed up a little too late getting the message ready for this morning. But on the plus side, I just finished teaching on a series on uh, the Lord's Prayer to the youth group um, this past month. So, if you, if you guys don't know, the very first phrase in the Lord's Prayer is, Our Father. It's like, hey, serendipitous. I like it. But thinking of fathers, obviously when you think about fathers, Father's Day, you, your mind can't help but think about your father. Uh, some people have amazing testimonies of loving, dedicated fathers. Some people have very hurtful memories of fathers who, who are anything but what a father should be. There are those who have testimonies of their fathers living long lives and being invested in, uh, in the lives of their children and their children's children. There are those who Father's Day is painful because their father was taken from them too soon in tragedy. Um, Father's Day is one of those days that just runs the gambit of emotions. For me, I was lucky in that I have a great dad. Uh, if anybody, if you knew my father, uh, you would understand me a little bit better. Uh, this morning at the first service when I said that uh, 
Susan was up here in the second row going, mm-hmm. Because uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, Pastor Glenn, uh, his older brother was one of my dad's best friends uh, through childhood. So Pastor Glenn has, has known my family, has known my dad uh, from some of his earliest memories. And uh, Susan has known them as well growing up, going to uh, similar camps and hanging out and spending time together. Uh, so if you want some funny stories, uh, yeah. So I'm sure Pastor Glenn could share some secondhand stories of me. Uh, my dad is... Say, so if you think I'm odd, I get it honestly. Um, my parents were always involved in children's church and in kids' camps, and uh, there was a program in the Nazarene Church called Caravan, uh, which was a scouting program. Um, not only would you learn how to start fires responsibly, how to tie knots, how to, uh, how to put tents together, all that, the basic uh, camping stuff that you learn in scouts, but it was a program through the church, so you also learned uh, Bible verses. You learned about the statements of faith of the Nazarene Church. Um, the Nazarene Church and the Wesleyan Church are, like, they run parallel to each other in beliefs. Um, but uh, I have so many memories of my dad and my mom teaching kids' church and leading all of the silly songs that you learn in kids' church. Uh, there's the animal song, which is all about how God made different animals. And uh, every time they would teach and we would sing, the animal song was one that was demanded every time because um, you, would, you would imitate whatever animal you were singing about. So, for example, one of our favorites was the elephant. Um, and the elephant, would, you would sing something along the lines of, well, elephants are big and slow, so you'd have to adopt a deep voice and you'd have to walk like an elephant. And elephants have trunks, so you'd have to get those and go, God made elephants to break a bog God made all. You might want to mute me for this, JD. Then there were also monkeys and dogs and all the other ridiculous animals. Uh, there's a uh, one of his favorites to sing was the uh, singing in the rain with the refrain between each time you sing it of, um, oh, what is it? Uh, now that I'm in the middle of it, I'm forgetting the, the between. But you do your thumbs out, elbows back, knees together, feet up, butt, head back, tongue out, ah, and singing in the rain. We have many pictures of my dad in just the most ridiculous poses because he loved kids. And he loved pouring into kids, and he loves to this day pouring into children and teenagers and uh, seeing him with my kids and my sisters and my brother's kids. Uh, he was just a great example of what it means to love the next generation of people. So a lot of how I teach and preach can be attributed to the oddness of my father. And a lot of people think that I grew up in a pastor's home because of the stories of my parents involved in the ministries of the church. Uh, oh, yeah, just, okay. Thought I cut out there for a second. But my dad has a PhD in physical chemistry. He is a chemist by trade. He is a nerd in every sense of the word. And I mean, I, I, I don't know anybody else that's like that. It's, you know, that, that trait was lost in the second generation. I'm definitely not. A anyway, but I was lucky in how my parents loved each other and served in the church and brought up me and my siblings in the church. And I didn't realize that there were bad fathers until much later in life. Because my dad was so present in not only my life, but the lives of my friends as well. So I'm able to have this testimony of what a father should be. And this contrast of what a father should be compared to what a lot of my friends, I found out later what their testimonies were of their fathers. It's just a very interesting dichotomy. There are some people who contend that we should get rid of Father's Day because of the hurt and the negativity surrounding the father image now. There's a lot of people who refuse, very similar to Mother's Day, where there's those who will not come to church on Mother's Day because of the pain that it that brings. There's similarly, with Father's Day, there is a lot of hurt. But I think this just kind of highlights the fact that there is an ideal 
of fatherness. There is something that fathers should be. And because not all fathers live up to this ideal, it causes a deeper pain. It causes a a stronger reaction. And as the church, it is our job to come alongside our world and say, that's right. Those feelings are valid. This is not what the Father should be. And we know that this is not how the Father should be because we have the Father to look at. We have the original Father, the origin of all things. And so, like I said, I was, I've been teaching through the Lord's Prayer. And when the disciples went to Jesus and asked, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples, he started off his prayer with Father. So in English, it's translated as Our Father, but in both Aramaic and in Greek, the very first word is Father, Abba, Pater. Pater Hemon, the father of us. And you may have heard it taught before that Abba is daddy language. It's like a little child running up to, the, to their parent's knee and tugging on and going, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And there, there may be some of that in there. But this idea of father, Jesus wasn't just teaching an intimacy with God Starting off your prayer by addressing God as Father is revolutionary language. So if you trace the theme of referring to God as Father through the scriptures, you are first taken to the Exodus, where the Israelite people had moved to the land of Egypt during a time of famine, when one of their number had been elevated to the second most powerful person in all of the land of Egypt— Because of the wisdom of this one Israelite son, the entire Egyptian people, and you could contend that the entire world was saved from famine and death because of the faithfulness of this one. And so the Egyptians gifted the Israelites this land. Generations passed. The Israelites prospered. The Egyptians grew scared, and a new pharaoh rose to power and oppressed those people. In the midst of this, God rose up one Israelite who was saved from a massacre, from a genocide, brought up in the Pharaoh's home, made a rather brash decision in killing an Egyptian to save a fellow Israelite, was exiled, encountered God in the wilderness, was commissioned to go and declare freedom to the people of Israel, And as Moses is returning to Egypt, the Lord comes to Moses and says, When you go back to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. I said to you, Let my son go, that he may worship me. The very first time in Scripture that God takes on the Father image has to do with bringing his people to freedom. It is Exodus language. It is freedom from slavery language. Going to God as Father declares that we have been held in bondage, but we are going to be free. And God is going to be the one that works towards our freedom. This, this theme of God as Father is picked, out, picked up throughout Scripture. An, the next major instance of it is in 2 Samuel, where God makes a covenant with David and says, I will be a father to him, and he shall be my son. Making this covenant with David. And then, in Isaiah, when the people are captive, are once again exiled, Isaiah prophesies that God will renew his covenant and will extend the promise of David to the people. 
reiterating that you are my children and I am your father. God, as father, carries weight. Again, it's not just familial familiarity. There's a responsibility to it. There's an acknowledgement to it. There is a weight that comes with acknowledging God as father. In the Isaiah passage, this taking on of the promise of David comes with a promise of the Messiah. The Messiah will rise up in the line of David and will become a deliverer for the people. We know, because the story has played out, that that Messiah was Jesus, and that Jesus came, lived, died, rose again, joined us with his death and resurrection, and so now we extend on and carry on the mission of Jesus. We fill a Jesus role in our world. We are the messianic people. We are the people of the new exodus. And so because we have been joined with Christ, the author of the Hebrews the author of the Hebrews picks up this father language. So I was listening to a podcast the other day, and uh, there was a person speaking how in, throughout the New Testament, you have father-son language, father-children language, but a lot of it is couched in terms of adoption, of being a slave first and then adopted into the family. In the book of Hebrews, that adoption language is pretty much absent. It just speaks about father-son, parent-child relationships. And so we read in Hebrews chapter 2, starting in verse 11, For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people, because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. And in Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, we are called co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs, brothers and sisters, children of God. In this context, it's, it's, there's a difference between father-child relationship that they had and father-child relationship that we have. There was an understood apprenticeship in a father-child relationship back then. Again, as I said, the way that I teach and preach and interact with the church, I learned from watching my father, from imitating my father, from being raised around the spirit of my father. Jesus lived taught, acted the way he did because of the intimacy that he had with his father. Because he, nothing that he did was anything other than what the father would do. He mirrored his father and he became like his father and he was an example of his father. And so if we are to take on the relationship of father and child, co-heirs with Christ, brothers and sisters with Christ, then we too must approach God in that apprentice-child posture. God, may I learn how you would interact with these people. Would, would that I would know what it is to love you truly. But how do I care for the creation that you have given me? How would you care for it? And it's only through approaching the Father as an apprentice child seeking to imitate and to reflect that we can actually pray in confidence Father in heaven, 
Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. That's not a declaration. That's not just stating a fact that God's name is holy. See, hallowed be your name isn't, and it's not just a statement of fact, it's a supplication. It's a prayer. It's a request. It is me saying that through my imitation of you, my Father, can I bring honor and glory to your name. Can I live in a way that when people see my life, your name is honored and glorified? But not only that, it's actually, it's actually a prayer that God would bring about the hallowedness of his name. See, in Ezekiel, in the 36th chapter of the prophet Ezekiel, we read this. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations to which you came. I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, and which you have profaned among them. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when through you I display my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove your, from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you shall live in the land that I give you, that I gave to your ancestors. And you shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will save you from all your uncleanness, and I will summon the grain and make it abundant, and lay no famine upon you. I will make the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field abundant, so that you may never again suffer the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you shall remember your evil ways and your dealings that were not good, and you shall loathe yourselves for your iniquities and your abominable deeds. It is not for your sake that I will act, says the Lord God. Let that be known to you. Be ashamed and dismayed for your ways, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord God, On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the towns to be inhabited, and the waste places shall be rebuilt. The land that was desolate shall be tilled, instead of being the desolation that it was in the sight of all who passed by. And they will say, This land that was desolate has become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined towns are now inhabited and fortified. Then the nations that are left all around you shall know that I, the Lord, have rebuilt the ruined places and replanted that which was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken, and I will do it. Thus says the Lord God, I will also let the house of Israel ask me to do this for them, to increase their population like a flock, like the flock for sacrifices, like the flock at Jerusalem during her appointed festivals. So shall the ruined towns be with flocks of people. Then they shall know that I am the Lord." Our Father, hallowed be your name. Would you act in our time as you promised in the book of Ezekiel? Not for our sake, not so that we look good, but because you are honorable and to be honored. God, would you act in such a way that people cannot help but honor your name? If we claim God as Father, we must constantly be examining and re-examining how we bear his name. This is the real meaning of you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It has little to do with an expletive that you may spout when you're not thinking. Just saying God's name, saying God, saying oh my God, that is, that is using God's name vainly. It is using it in a way that it does not honor and respect. But the deeper meaning, do you claim the name of Christ? Do you claim God as Father, but then live in a way that does not show deliverance, restoration, holiness, and renewal? Do we claim God as Father and then keep at arm's length those who aren't as pure as I am? Do we claim God as Father and condemn the world outside the church? Or, as we pray 
the prayer that God taught us to pray? Are we humbled by the fact that we can approach God as Father? That Do we recognize that He is in the process of hallowing His name despite our inadequacies? Do we realize that as we try to live out the kingdom of God here and now on earth as in heaven that we fall short? And so we, we ask God to give us what we need from day to day and to look around those around us and see, well, where can I meet their needs for daily bread? And realizing that we still fall short, we ask that God would forgive us of that debt we owe him and of our sins and of our trespasses and, uh, and of our insufficiencies and allow us to forgive everyone around us because we all fail and we all don't quite measure up. And we rely on him to deliver us from evil because it is he who has the power, he who has the authority, he who has the glory forever and ever. Amen. So our Father in heaven, we approach boldly, humbly, kind of tongue-in-cheek, saying, God, I know I don't have the right to call you Father. I have not lived up to the image that you have, that you have set, but I want to. And I want you to show me when I mess up and fall down face flat in the mud, I want you to cleanse me as a father who picks up their child and doesn't stand 10 feet off with the power washer and spray off their child, but goes and bathes their child. It doesn't matter what muck gets on my arms. If my kids need clean, I'm going to wash them because I love them and I am their father. And so Jesus, God himself, got elbows deep in the muck of our humanity because God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have eternal life because God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world might be saved, cleansed, restored, made holy. So when we pray our Father, are we living as children of God? Is God's name blessed or blasphemed because of how I'm living and how I represent his name? Where is God working in me to deliver, restore, renew, and make holy? Where is God working through me to deliver, restore, renew, and make holy? As we conclude this morning, may we reflect on how we have been, how we have acted, how we have fulfilled our role as apprentice children to the Father who loves us. And how are we extending that invitation to be apprentice children to those who do not yet know the love and care, who may see an image of God that is hurtful and hating and harming because of the failure of fathers and mothers, of churches and congregations. May we be a church that brings and reflects the honor and glory that God has simply because he is holy. Let us pray. Father God, we are humbled and thankful for your active work in our life and in our world. In the midst of a world that is crying out in pain, from pain caused from generations and generations of inequity. Lord God, would you equip us as your church, as your apprentice children, to reflect your work. Not because we, by our strength and our goodness, can bring about 
a new creation, but because you are already working to restore your creation to how you intend it to be. Lord God, work in us so, so fully that we cannot help but see the work that you are doing around us, that we cannot help but love as you would love and care for those who are lost and hurting not in condemnation, not in trying to force them to fit a mold that we have created. But as we walk alongside them, as you walk alongside us, the transformative power of your spirit infusing and filling and permeating your world would transform us more and more from glory to glory. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, our debts, our trespasses as we forgive those who have sinned and trespass against us. Lord God, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Go now in peace to love and serve your Father who loves you. Amen and amen.